Hi and welcome. I'm David Freck. I'm the lead pastor of Church of the Harvest and we're thankful you took the time to be a part of our YouTube channel for the rebroadcasting of our live services. You're taking the time to watch a sermon, whether it's sometime in the morning, in the middle of your day, if it's an off day, not Sunday. We're just excited you took the time to continue your growth in your relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe the sermon's gonna inspire you. We believe it's gonna give you practical things that you can apply to your life that are gonna make a difference as you move through your life. So I wanna encourage you to do something. Would you take the time while you're watching this broadcast and would you just connect with us? Just let us know. There's all kinds of ways that's down in the description below and that you can connect to us through our website, app, many other ways. We would just like to know you, get to know you better and be introduced to you. So that'd be our pleasure, our blessing. Once again, I pray that the service that you're watching right now is gonna make a difference in your life and you'll be able to carry it with you as you move in your relationship with Jesus. I wanna, I wanna just launch into kind of our last vision. Now we made a decision uh, late last year that we were going to refresh ourselves on the four visions of our church. And these are the, these are the DNA components. These are the things that uh, we believe God has built into us as a, a specific DNA code, something that is uh, really who we are. Uh, outside of the classic understanding of what a church is, uh, for what God has called our church, Church of the Harvest 2. It doesn't mean that other churches and their visions are, are inconsequential. They're not. They're important to the whole purpose of the body of Christ. But, but we have these specific callings. The field, talking about our mission, understanding the harvest, understanding what our harvest is, not just having church services, but understanding that our world, every individual's world is their harvest field and they need to mine the treasure, discover the treasure in their harvest field, the places that they've been called to steward. Then we go, to, we go to the throne where it is that place of worship, the place where the kingdom culture is what dominates the environment, dominates the atmosphere. It's the way we relate to each other based on kingdom principles, not cultural principles, not uh, nationalistic principles, not racial principles, sociological principles. The kingdom of God is what decides how we relate to one another. And we do that all as we approach the throne of God. So it's based in worship. It's based in an atmosphere of the presence of God. Then we get to, and, and Pastor Kenny did a beautiful job talking about the house last week. And, and the house is a house of healing. And man, I'll tell you, you look around and you say, well, it doesn't feel like there's been a whole lot of healing going on. Uh, but I, I just want to, I want you all to understand that, that whenever you make, uh, whenever you stand on a declaration of God, the enemy is going to challenge it. He's going to challenge it. And the fact is, is that healing isn't necessary if everybody's always healthy. So we're probably going to have to deal with this at a, at a higher level than others. But that's okay. That's okay. And I, I want to just talk that it's not just about a house of healing. It's about a house of health. That God just doesn't want, to, just, just doesn't want us to uh, come in with our problem and our disease and our infirmity and our, our brokenness. But he, he also wants us to sustain wholeness, to, to sustain relational health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health. Some of us have physical breakdowns because we don't take care of ourselves. Thank you, pastor. Right? And so God wants us to, and he's called us to be a house of healing, healing and health, where God brings wholeness and health to our souls, our minds, our bodies, our spirits. And so that's what God's called us to. And then the final one we're going to talk about today, which is the fire, the fire. Everybody say the fire. Send the fire. So I, I want to just share with you the vision that the Lord gave us at the early stages of our church. I was uh, in prayer. Spirit of God uh, just kind of took me kind of in a, I wasn't dreaming. It was, uh, I'm, I was wide awake, but I, I saw this clear vision of a large, a large, what I would call a campfire, just a large campfire, stones all around it, but a nice blazing, hot, white, orange, blues, you know, coming out of, and yellows coming out of this, this fire that is, it's not out of control, but it is, it is strong, it is dynamic, it is powerful. And I see, uh, I see these arrows that are laced in this fire. The, the points of the arrows or the uh, heads of the arrows are in the fire. And of course, you can see the, the tails of the arrows sticking out. And all of a sudden, a hand reaches in, grabs one of those arrows, and puts it in the bow, in a bow that's just, I, I don't see anything but this bow. And it's pulled back and it's launched. And the arrow went, and I just saw this map of the world. This arrow went and landed with the fire that 
that came from that campfire landed in various points around the nation, around the world. And I, and I realized that God had called us to be a kingdom-sending church, that God had called us to empower and to send developed leaders, that this fire was to be carried, that we weren't just to be a gathering house, but we were to be a sending house. And, and I know it, 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 when it comes to family, who likes sending? Anybody? Anybody? You know, when, when, you're, when your 20-year-old says, Mom and Dad, it's time for me to go, some of you are like, great, get. But some, some are like, you know, it's, it's a sad day because you realize things are changing. Things in your house are changing. But does it change, the, does it change your family? No, it only changes the dynamic of the family. It just feels different on a day-to-day. And, and we've seen it happen for years, for years, since the beginning of our church. God would bring in uh, pastors that had gone through difficult times, had real drama, real hurt, real trauma. They come in here, they get healed, the, that, he, that house principle. God refreshes, restores, and then releases them back. Into, I've seen, we've seen it happen dozens of times. We've seen God take families that have been a part of significant ministry. We just did it with the Trouts just a, a couple weeks ago. Where, where we release them to our other campus, and they're influencing that, and they're, they're fighting that. And by the way, we want you to be mindful to pray for Lori. She had a, a, a tremendous trauma. Her brother was shot dead just a few days ago by his son. And, uh, and, so, and then the, the son committed suicide. So it's just a, a horrible situation for their family. They need prayer for sure. So please, please, please be praying for the Trouts. And, uh, and so, but there they are, they're fighting these battles and they're family, they're still family, right? And, and so whatever the environment is, we need to be constantly reminded that God isn't just about us gathering things, but God is also uh, about us releasing things. If, if your child is still in your house and is no, it has no issues and they're still in your house after 40 years, you've done something wrong. Come on, somebody. You, you, you just done something wrong because they're supposed to make their own, they're supposed to have their own family. They're supposed to go multiply, then return, and then go again. <laughs> so so that, that's, how it, that's how it works. So God's called us to empower and send developed leaders. So Jesus understood this. Jesus understood this. And that's why he told his disciples, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go, then the comforter doesn't come, the paraclete doesn't come, and if he doesn't come, then you're not going to go and do what the mission is for the kingdom in the world. So I got to get out of the way so that you can be released, so you can be sent. In fact, this is what he says in John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Now, this is the resurrected Lord. This isn't, this isn't pre-cross. This is post-cross. This is post-resurrection. So Jesus has risen from the grave, and he's standing there with his disciples, and how many would say, you know, if I've got a man that has conquered the death that he conquered, and conquered the grave that he conquered, and he's standing before me right now, come on, standing before me, maybe what he's saying I ought to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so here's what he says. He says, peace I, as the Father has what? Sent me, even so I'm sending you. Now, the very first thing you want to do is you want to qualify this. And you want to say, well, this is only about those 12 men. Well, 11 at this point. These are only about these 11 men. But that is not what he's saying because we see this principle being released when this is followed up in Acts chapter 2 that it wasn't just about those men. It was about another 120, essentially, plus another 3,000. Plus, it's ongoing perspective of release into the earth. So then he, said to the, then he said to them, receive, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Father sent me, I'm sending you, and I'm going to give you the same power that I've got. And he breathes on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So here's the problem. There, there's, there's a initiative here that we have to buy into. Here's the initiative. Receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. I got to buy into God wants to send me and I've got to receive the grace, the power, the anointing to do what he's sending me to do. Amen. I've got to receive that. 
In other words, I've got to make two decisions. I'm willing to be sent, and I'm willing to receive. Do we have anybody in the house willing to be sent and willing to receive? If you're willing to be sent and you're willing to receive, then God has made you a candidate for this thing called the fire. He's made you a candidate. So how do we get a, how do we get a fire started? Because some of us don't feel a lot of fire. Maybe we don't feel a lot of spiritual passion. Maybe we don't feel a lot of spiritual direction. Maybe we don't have a, a sense of, I've got, I've, got a, I've got an objective. I've got a mission. I've got something in front of me I've got to accomplish. So let's go to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Matthew chapter 11. This is when Jesus starts his ministry. Okay? So many of you know the story. He, he uh, comes down to the Jordan, and John the Baptist, that's not his last name. He was just a person that baptized people. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. Just like a lot of people think Jesus Christ, Christ is his last name. That's not his last name. So the point is, is he, he, he comes, Jesus comes down, and John tells us, the Gospel of John tells us that when he comes down towards the jo- Jordan, Jesus is immediately identified by John. Now, John knows Jesus. You need to know that this isn't the first time they've seen each other. They're cousins. Okay? So he, he comes down, and when he sees him, he doesn't identify him. Hey, cuz! He didn't do that. He identifies him as the Lamb of God. Now, he, the whole reason he's on doing what he's doing is because he's preparing the way for the Lord's Messiah. And he announces every time he's baptizing, every time he's preaching, he says, listen, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm preparing the way for the Messiah. I'm the entry point. He's identifying the Messiah is going to come through this environment. He's going to be identified in this situation. He's going to be identified with what I'm teaching, what I'm preaching. I'm the entry point for the Messiah to be seen, discovered, known, and released into the world. And so what he does is after he looks up and he sees Jesus, he doesn't relate to him as cousin. He identifies him as Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus immediately goes into the water. He's standing there. And he says, you know, it's time to be baptized. Of course, John's like, no, 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 no. I need to be baptized by you. No, you're the fulfillment of all this. At this point, I think in John's mind, he's done. At this point, he's like, you're going to baptize me. Then I'm going to be a part of what you're doing. And, And God has a different plan. You ever been there, you brought God your plan, and he rejects it? Come on, come on. Am I the only person that's happened to? And, and so we, we, we know that's the story that he's baptized, he comes up out of the water, the Spirit of God descends on him as a form of a dove, and the, boy, the heavens open, and God speaks and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's great, it's a great expression. But before that, look at what, Look at what John says as a setup to this moment. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me, this is just before Jesus comes on the scene, but he who coming after me is mightier than me, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will immerse you, he will submerge you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, now now I want you to see something. I'm going to get through my message. How many believe that's possible? I haven't preached for a couple weeks, so be, be careful. So think about this. He's saying Jesus is bringing a couple of things that he's going to submerge you in. He's bringing the Holy Spirit. So you're going to get submerged. Now listen, you've got to understand that conceptually the Holy Spirit is kind of a fresh thought. They see the Holy Spirit as, you know, the the presence of God or God. They're not quite sure. They understand the Spirit of the Lord, but then they're not quite sure how to relate to this hagios pneuma, the Holy Spirit. They're not quite sure what this is, but he's saying he's bringing this clearer expression of how you understand the Spirit of the Lord, how you understand God's presence. He's bringing it with him. And he's not just bringing it with him so you can see it. He's bringing it with him so you can be immersed in it. 
And not just that, but he's also bringing something else that we might not like as well. It's called fire. He's bringing fire. And you're going to be immersed in that. Now, I don't know about any of you, but if you think about fire and immersion in fire, it is repelling by its very nature. <clears throat> Who? Because if you think about being put into fire, it means immediate pain. Is there anybody, anybody that could think about sticking your hand in fire that you don't think, I don't want to do that because it's create pain and it's going to create injury, yeah. right? But we're thinking of it only in natural terms. So he says, I'm good. he's going to immerse you in fire. He's going to bring you into an environment that is going to be purging and purifying, in some cases painful, Certainly difficult. It's going to be revealing. It's going to be exposing. It's going to eliminate the unnecessary. It's going to produce the pure. I ain't getting many amens. All right, I'll bring another preach in next week. Acts chapter 2, look at this. So let's, let's talk about the day this happens in a real way. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire, so that you, they don't know how to describe it as, as opposed to saying these look like flames. These look like flames rested on each of them. I don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop a quarter in the slot. I'm going to watch that when I get to heaven. I'm going to hit the you know, on-demand button. And figure out, I, I want to see this event. I just want to see what it was like. And it rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So you see the combination here? You see the fire, and you see the Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So let's talk about the qualities and the characteristics and the symbolism of fire. So fire is essential for two primary reasons. It produces heat and light. We manage and control fire every day in its various forms for these two purposes. Primarily. For light, so you know, in the incandescent light bulb days, <laughs> we're past that now, but in those incandescent light bulb days, or back in the time of Christ, uh, light was produced by a candle, or a fire, or a torch. That was the flashlight of the day. That was the, that was the house lights of the day. So you would have, you would have a, a, a torch or you would have a, um, some kind of a, a mechanism where a flame was lit and it was controlled. It was in an environment that would give a slow burn and it would illuminate. It wouldn't necessarily produce enough heat to cook anything or do anything of that, but, of that nature, but it would give you light in the room. Then you had controlled fire for the purpose of cooking, for the controlled, uh, controlled fire for the purpose of warming your house. And so this was kind of the environment where we understand that light is there to produce light and heat. And Jesus said something about you and I. He said, you are the light of the world. You can't be a light without being on fire. I'm going to say it again. You're not just a light because somebody flips a switch in you. You're a light because you're on fire. You have a passion for God. You have a passion for his word. You have a passion for the things that matter to him. There is something inside of you that is burning to want to reveal Christ in the earth. There is something inside of you that is burning to see Christ's name glorified in the earth. There is something inside of you that is on fire for God. A city set on a hill can't be healed, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But they do what? They put it on a stand and it gives light in all the house. In other words, God wants to put a fire in you so that other people can see him. And that's what he does it for. So this thing called the fire, this thing called the Holy Spirit is put in us, not just so we can feel better about ourselves, but he's put in us for a purpose. When we saw the light, the, the campfire, we saw this light and we saw this heat, but it was about igniting something that could be sent into the world. And that's people, folks. It's always about people. 
It's used to illuminate, it's used to cook, it's used to forge, it's used to warm and power, it's used to purify, destroy, consume, and it proves things. Here's what Malachi says. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Do you see this? And they will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness. So now all of a sudden you get to see another layer to why fire exists. Not just, not just to produce uh, a, a glow that points people to Christ, but it's also about purging us from the stuff that is impure and unnecessary that, that, so that we can be what? So that we can be gold and silver, so that we can be valuable to the purposes of the kingdom of God. I'm here to tell you that the biggest problems we have in getting, in getting God into the earth, the biggest problems we have in getting God into our homes, getting God into our families, getting God into our environments, isn't the devil. It is the stuff in us that hasn't been exposed or treated by the fire. Back in the day, and I'm old so I can say that now, back in the day we called it sanctification. We used language about how God would come into our lives and how God would purge the stuff in us that wasn't appropriate, necessary, helpful, or a blessing. And we used to embrace that idea. But today, we, we've kind of shifted that. We want to add God to our craziness. We become duplicitous because it's like, well, God just, he's got grace for this. And he does has great, have grace for it. Not to excuse it, but to remove it. But we, we found a reason why it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. But I might suggest to you that if we're going to be everything God wants us to be, it isn't okay. I will also tell you that when it comes to fire, when it comes to light, intensity determines effect. Low intensity, low effect. Now, how many know that I can light a candle, right? I can put a candle here, I can light the candle, and I can put my hand up here and I can feel the heat, but it doesn't create any context or pain or response. But the closer I get to it, the quicker I'm going to be to respond to it. Anybody with me? If the fire gets intense you got to do something about it, or it's going to consume the environment. And, and I'm going to suggest the issues in our life that are not dealt with is about proximity and intensity. Yeah, that was a good place for an amen. Yeah, some of you just totally missed it. I even paused. <laughs> intensity determines effect. It is a symbol. Fire is a symbol of passion, purity, ability, testing, adversity. Whenever you've gone through a difficult time, you say, man, I've been through the fire. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Here's what 1 Corinthians 3.13 says. By the way, we're never going to avoid this, just in case you want to know. Uh, you, might, you might think I, 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 you can avoid it in this life. You won't be able to avoid it eternally. There's a day coming. I know we don't talk about this, but there's a day coming. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. There's a day coming when everybody's works are going to be exposed. Each one's work, 1 Corinthians 3.13, each one's works will become manifest or revealed, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by better here than there. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Whether it's gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Each one's works will be consumed. And if, and, and if, if it's consumed, <laughs> then we have nothing of value to present to God. If, it is, if it's put through that fire and it's exposed as precious, then we have reward. So here's, 
Here's the thing that I want to kind of point us to today. I, I, I want to I try to ignite something in us. Whether you're watching online, whether you're here in this room, I want you and I to start a fire. I want a fire to get started in us. And I, you know, we've, we've all been through seasons where the fire's hotter, the fire's colder. Listen, when you, if, you're, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, I, I got kind of obsessed there for a while with this um, t- television show called Alone. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but Alone is this show where they basically take like 10 people and they scatter them out in the most remote places in the world and they, they're only allowed to take 10 things with them and uh, they have to learn how to live on the land and they have to learn how to exist and survive in very difficult environments. And uh, there, you know what the first objective, there's really two initial objectives. The first one is some kind of shelter and the second one is fire. They got to get a fire started. Because if they don't get a fire started, they can't purify their water, they can't cook their food, they can't stay warm. Right. So a fire is essential and a shelter is essential. And, and, and so they, 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 it's all about the pursuit of those two things initially. Then they'll worry about food, then they'll worry about other things. But the fire is really at the top of the list. And so they're, they're looking for things to start a fire. So they, and sometimes they've got this soaking environment where it's raining or snowing. And it's like i got to find something dry that I can put together so that I can create a little something to get a little spark going. If I can get a little spark going, get a little kindling going, then, I, then I'm going to build this thing. And they might spend hours building this thing called a fire. I remember in one episode, uh, this person could not get his fire going. He could not get a fire going. He was out within three days just because he couldn't have a fire. He didn't have a fire. And I, and I want to suggest to you that, that a fire should be something that we see as an elemental principle to our life. And, and the one concern in this, in this show is that they would fall asleep and let the fire go out. Yeah. That, that their, their, their priority, daily priority, was making sure they sustained their fire. And I want to suggest to you that your devotional life and your Bible reading and your, your home groups and all the things that you, these are, these are the things that keep your fire going. And when you, and when you delay or deny, all of a sudden things get cold in your soul and they get cold in your spirit and they get cold in your family and they get cold in your environment and the next thing you know, it doesn't matter and, and you find yourself looking for other ways to heat yourself. So let, let's start a fire. Or in some of our instances, let's, let's stoke our fire. Let's build it up. Let's get it going. So there's three primary things you've got to have for a fire. You've got to have fuel, something that's consumable. You've got to have air, an atmosphere with oxygen in it. And you have to have heat. You have to have something that has ignition temperature so that something can get started. Whether it's a match or it's a spark, there's gotta be something that ignites the fuel and the combination of the fuel in the air. That's how your car drives, by the way. There's this combination of fuel and air and then spark, and that's what creates horsepower. Every time you turn on your engine, these principles are at work, unless you're electric. (laughs) Which I guess we're going to. So let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Let's get, this, let's get this fire started. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And the divided tongues of fire appeared on them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The fuel. What's the fuel in this environment? What's the thing that God is going to ignite? It's the disciples. They're the fuel. Here's here's the reality. When when John the Baptist said, he's coming with the Holy Spirit and with fire, he was talking about you and I becoming consumables. That all of a sudden, our life was going to be for the purpose of sustaining the fire. An environment where the fire could continue to warm and heat and purify and purge and minister. The idea that the fire is for me 
is really contrary to the principle of the fire. The fire is really for others. The fire is for the purpose of God in the earth. The fire is the thing that we are meant to be consumed by. It's about being mission-minded, kingdom-focused, motivated, love-motivated people. That if I'm going to be an environment that God can start, I can't be wet wood. Thank you. I've got, to, I've got to be something that can be consumed. What do I have layering my life? What have I allowed to soak into me that is keeping me from being consumable? Have I lost my mission-mindedness? Have I lost my kingdom focus? Have I lost my love? Do you remember when he was talking to the Ephesians, he said, he said I, I, I've got something against you. You've lost your first love. Repent, do your first works over again. And then he said, if that's the case, I won't take your lampstand away. In other words, your fire can remain. There's a reality that, that we, listen, life is designed by the enemy, not by God. The life, life is tried to be manipulated so that you and I lose our fire. And sometimes there's huge gusts of wind. Sometimes there's huge storms that come into our life. And one of the purposes behind it is to eliminate the fire in you. Could be a loss of a family member. It could be a, 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 a bad report from a doctor. It could be a relational divorce. It could be a job change. It could be any number of things. And the enemy wants to take that and make that a dampening experience in your life. But I want to be so white hot for God that let it rain, let it pour, let it blow. The fire is just going to keep going. It can survive the environments because it's white hot and sustainable. I have to be ignitable. I have to be receptive. I have to be willing to be consumed. Here's, here's the admonition of Paul in Romans chapter 12. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as kindling, as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, the presentation of my life, my body, who I am to God is what makes me consumable. It's what makes me fuel. And Paul's begging us to do it. Thus, God is begging us to do it. Amen. He's saying, listen, you, you've got to understand that this presenting of yourself to God, that's, listen, that's why we gather. This is one of the reasons we gather. Yeah. It's an environment where we continually assess. That's why we do communion. Communion is a possibility every time you gather here because it's this reminder, wait a second, where am I in relationship to the cross? Amen. Where am I in relationship to God? Where am I? It's, it's these things that are saying, present yourself, present yourself. That's why we receive offerings. It's a part of presenting ourselves. These are all components that are challenging us. Am I giving what I need to give to God? Am I making myself available to him? That's why there's opportunities for service. And it's not just in this environment. It's in every environment that we're in. We can't just be consumable, but we also have to have we have to have an environment, an atmosphere. It's called air. I need kindling. I need wood. I need something that can be consumed, fuel. But I also need an environment. I need oxygen. Without oxygen, you can have the fuel right, you can have the spark right, but if you don't have oxygen, it can't work. So I need the right environment. That's why we have to contend for the space in our soul that is meant for worship and faith. Faith and worship are the two components that create the environment to receive and to release Amen. in your life. Amen. That's why we go to the trouble to worship. That's why we just don't come in here and have a Bible study and go home. It's because we need this environment where I can have a point of release, where I can exercise faith in prayer, where I can exercise my devotion and my celebration and my praise and my adoration and my devotion to God, it keeps, my, it keeps the environment in my soul ready. 
See, faith in the promise of God, which reflected itself in the action of positioning myself and then patiently waiting. That was the environment. Remember, there's 120 people in this upper room. And remember, they started seven days earlier. They started with 500 plus. And within a few days, they've lost two-thirds of their congregation. That is crisis in a church. You think COVID's been bad on us. This is crisis. And, and these 120 are there, and they, they, don't know, they don't know what they're waiting for. They're just waiting for the promise. They don't know what it's going to look like. They don't know what it's going to feel like. They don't know how they're going to know. They don't know anything about this, but they, they simply said, you know what? Jesus told us to do this. Wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. Wait until you receive the promise, right? Yeah. And so, and they're like, we're here. I'm in. Yeah. He didn't say wait for five days. He didn't say wait for a month. Yep. He didn't give them a timeline. Isn't that what bugs us? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the thing that drives us crazy? Yeah. It's like, well, if you just tell me how long I got to do this. I hate it when we, we, we I, as you know, I do jujitsu, and, and, and one of the things that happens is in training, we have this clock, right? We have this, this timer. It, it, when we roll, it's usually five minutes, and they set the timer, you hear the beep, and you know, okay, I got five minutes to fight. And, and every now and then, when you've had a really hard fight, you look up at the clock. <laughs> You're like, man, I only got to hold on for 30 more seconds. Right? Or I can rest for 30 more seconds, I'm going to hear that beat. But every now and then, the professor doesn't turn the clock on. He says, okay, fight. We're like, well, how long? I'll let you know. Could be a quick whistle. Could be a long whistle. I've done it where we had a 30-minute roll with one person. Because he didn't turn the timer on. So I didn't know how to regulate myself. I didn't know how to relate to, 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 to what the expectations were because I didn't know what the professor is the only one that knew. And I'm going to tell you, that's the thing that drives us crazy because we want to control even the process. And God, God didn't set the timer on this. He just said, wait. Roll until I blow the whistle. And I'm here to tell you, some of you are in that place where you're like, I don't know if I can do this another minute. Well, you don't know if it's going to be another minute. You don't know if it's going to be another hour. That's why you need to persevere. That's why you need to have this thing called faith, that God knows when to blow the whistle. And I'm learning something in the struggle. And I'm learning how to trust God and trust what God has put in me. <laughs> Excuse me. Can I tell you what the key to waiting is? How many want to know? How many don't because you don't want to wait? <laughs> You're going to love this answer. This is the key. You, if you don't write anything down, write this down. The key to waiting is worship. You can wait as long as you worship. When you quit worshiping, you start looking at the timer. <laughs> I'll prove it to you scripturally. Psalm 40. That sounded like a good statement. Let's look at it. I waited how long? Patiently. Can anybody tell me how long that is? Anybody know? I waited. Who am I waiting for? Not your wife. Not your kids, not your boss, not the delivery man. Who are you waiting for? <laughs> you mean the Lord is demanding me to wait, and he's stretching a thing in me called patience. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. He inclined to me, and he heard my cry. When? When? When he was ready. We should go to the next scripture. Uh, here's, here's the next scripture. You ready? 
Let's just read the first two words. How you doing? How you doing with that? Let's say it together. Come on, you can say it. Let's try that again. Some of you don't want to say it. Come on online, type it in. Be patient, therefore, brothers, sisters, till when? <laughs> well, at least you know when it's going to stop. <laughs> Be patient until the Lord comes. Now, we, think, we can think of this eschatologically, but I want you to think about your circumstance. Be patient until the Lord shows up in that situation. Be patient until the Lord shows up in that situation. Be patient until the Lord shows up in this environment. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Come on, somebody. Final piece, I'm done. Heat. So the fuel is us. The atmosphere, right, the oxygen is faith coupled with worship, and the igniter is the Holy Spirit. I baptize you with water, John said, but he who's coming after me, who's mightier than I, who I'm not worthy to carry his shoes, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and Ultimately, it takes a spark from God. Ultimately, it takes God releasing something into your soul. These 120 in this upper room that day, they waited patiently until the Lord heard them. And you knew that he heard them when all of a sudden, fire showed up. Come on, somebody. It landed on top of them. Each one got their own piece of the fire. It wasn't just one fire that kind of covered them all. It was individual expressions of fire. In other words, God is going to ignite you in the same way yet differently. How he works in me might not be the same way he works in you. The fire that he works in me might not be the same way he works in you. But the point is, we've all got an ignition from the Holy Spirit of God. The divided tongues of fire appeared on them, on each of them. The fire of the Holy Spirit created the power, the internal combustion that propelled the church into its mission and its purpose in the earth. This was the beginning of the church. This is when it all started. The result of that day is what you see today, not just here, but around the world. In every environment, whether it's behind the iron curtain or the bamboo curtain, whether it's in a a, a hovel on on the other side of a creek or whether it's in a magnificent cathedral. The events of that day determined what is being experienced around the world globally for over 2,000 years. The church, listen, has it had its mistakes? Has it had its faux pas? Has it had its dark times? Yes. But folks, the church is still advancing. Here's the question that we have to answer today. I'm done. The worship team can come. Here's the question we have to answer today. What's moving you? Do you have the fuel? Have you made yourself available to God? Are you standing in faith and worship even when things aren't happening in the timeline you want them to? And are you waiting patiently until the ignition from the Holy Spirit? Here's what I know. This will comfort some of you. God is never, ever, ever, ever early. I said that correctly. He's never early. How many wished he would be? There's 20 honest people in the room. I just wished I didn't have to go through. But, but the key word is through. No, you're going you're gonna to make it as long as you don't absorb something into your consumable that makes you unignitable. 
as long as you remain in an environment of faith and worship, you will be the object of the ignition spark of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we just get impatient with God. We get impatient with life. We get impatient with circumstances. We get impatient with people. It's in our nature because we want things done yesterday. And so much about our world is instant and immediate. You don't even have to go shop for groceries anymore. You don't have to. You could literally stay in your home and never see another human being. You could literally do it. And you could be sustained. But is that what God wants? Is that what God wants from us? No. No, life is better with the incongruities. Because in all these incongruities, God has an opportunity to reveal himself. God gets to expose your faith and your worship. He prepares us for a thing that's greater than us. So Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you right now to make us ready to receive the fire of the Holy Spirit. Lord, send an anointing that would break down our barriers and our walls and our excuses. Lord, I pray that you would visit people in a very unique and powerful way today. In the mighty name of Jesus.